Hello, everyone. My name is Richard Sewell. I am the chair of the National Association of, excuse me, the co-chair of the National Association of, Association of Hispanic Journalists chapter here on campus. Thank you so much for joining us this event on this event that we're hosting, a discussion of indigenous peoples in journalism. Uh, before we begin today's event, however, uh, we should recognize that we are on unceded land of the Chochetno speaking Muwekma Ohlone people. Not only should we acknowledge that, but we ought to be cognizant of our university's ongoing role in enforcing colonialism. Our very own NHA member, Jesse Fali Tapia, has written in detail about this matter for the Indigenous Lee newsletter, which I recommend checking out. His reporting covered a 2019 state audit scrutinizing the UC system, which found that UC Berkeley has an abysmal record of returning Indigenous artifacts and remains under the, under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatri Repatriation Act, otherwise known as NAGPRA. The school holds a collection of nearly 500,000 artifacts and remains, larger than any other collection of its kind in the US. UCLA and UC Davis have returned or were in the process of repatriating 90% of their collections to tribes. Meanwhile, our school had returned only 20% under NAGPRA. A key reason for this is that returns of artifacts and remains are mandated under the law for tribes that are federally recognized, something that something the Muwekma Ohlone lack despite requesting it for over 30 years and having over 550 members in, here in the Bay Area, a region the Ohlone have lived in for at least 6,000 years. We recognize these egregious acts of colonialism. We recognize that we have benefited off stolen land, and we recognize the Muwekma Ohlone tribe are still here with us today. Thank you. And let us now meet our guest speaker today. She's an environmental reporter for the Arizona Republic, a National Press Foundation FETI Award winner. She was named Best Beat Environmental Reporter by the Native American Journalists Association, just to name a few accolades she's been awarded. She is an enrolled member of the Halon Salinan tribe from Central California, and she's a self-described 400th generation Californian. Please welcome Ms. Deborah Crow. Hi. So, so Ms. Crow, I want to start with reading a quote from you. you you've, said, you've said before, growing up, I used to read these newspaper articles that said my tribe is extinct, and I knew my tribe wasn't extinct. That's why I became a journalist. Could you please elaborate on that and why you got into journalism? Well pretty much that reason. Um, my, my tribe is not one of those that, that makes a big deal of itself. It's, it's been really hard for us or, or for the tribe as a whole, individual tribal members like myself notwithstanding to put themselves out in the world. A, a lot of this can go right back to the early days of US statehood. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we know that the Spaniards had come in, and and missionized a, a lot of Ms. Crow, apologies. You you've frozen for for a bit. Um, we can't hear you right now. Yes, we still can't hear you. I'm I'm sorry for this. Unstable. Oh, we're hearing a little bit of you now. It's still unclear. Ms. Crow, are you are you there? We can't hear you right now. Unmute. Oh, we I, just heard you. I was going to say, I'd say a bad word, but then you would probably, it would probably be saved on, on the internet forever. So, <laughs> but anyways, back in the early days of U.S. statehood, you know, the Spaniards had already done their work. We had a bit of a respite went during um, um, Mexican rule because the Mexicans were more like, yes, they can be citizens, they can own land. They might be second-class citizens, but they're citizens. And there wasn't nearly the 
the oppression or or the atrocities that happened um, right after um, California statehood, because mm -hmm. as soon as California became a state, the the first governor of, of California put out an order that in order for decent white people to inhabit the state, all the Indians were gonna have to go. So there was a concerted effort to wipe out any native person within the state line of the state of California for about 30 years. A lot of native people suffered um, pretty bad. By the time this was all over, about 80% of all the remaining native people in California had been wiped off. Um, that number, is kind of subject to a little bit of iffiness because a lot of the mission tribes like ourselves saw what was coming and went into hiding. Um, mm -hmm. and, but in our case, we did have one massacre over on the coast. I believe it was 16, uh, 15 or 16 tribal members um, were, were shot dead inside a cave on the coast. And that was the end of it. They said, you know, we're not warriors. We're, we're not we're not, you know, we are vastly outnumbered and we need to survive. So a lot of them, you know, just assume their, their Hispanic identities. You know, they all spoke Spanish. Mm. They all had Hispanic last names. They, they became very insular. And if anybody, including a census taker, asked them where they were from, if you see something that says born just Mexico, it's probably an Indian. Mm, okay. Uh, that that makes it a little hard unless you have records before that to prove your indigeneity to the colonial um, agency, also known as Bureau of Indian Affairs. We managed to do it, but it was pretty rough. But the thing is, is that at the end of that period, the the Holon Salinan people were very insular. They didn't want to tell anybody. They didn't want to admit to being native. They, mm -hmm. they still lived according to how they had always lived. My ancestors, you know, in small communities, which are basically extended families, you know, mm -hmm. they still knew where everybody was. There were still Indians in Alone. There was Indians mm -hmm. in San Lucas. There was in, Indians in, in Cayucas and Indians up by Soledad at, at the edge where the Esalen territory takes over. We all knew where each other was. And so when we would get together, it would be during Fiesta Day at Mission San Antonio, Fiesta Day at Mission San Miguel, um, barbecues, rodeos, roundups, um, control burns, you know, we have to burn the stuff off of your ranch in, in the spring. So we all, we all maintained those connections, but the world didn't know. Mm. Um, and then in the early 20th century, there was this big scandal and Florence Atherton and Phoebe Hearst led the charge saying, we need to do something. The Indians are starving, but we've got to give them some land and what we've been doing by them. So the United States Indian agents around to determine how many still land, can we get them some land? Um, our oral history says that a guy by the name of Kelsey came to Halone and there was a little meeting hall in Halone. And a, a lot of my ancestors, my not really ancestors by this point, like great grandparents and great aunts and great uncles were sitting around there drinking coffee or drinking beer and playing, playing peon. And he basically walked in and says, Are there any Indians in here? And they all looked at him and it's like, who's <laughs> white guy? Uh, do we want to tell them? No, hell no, don't say anything. So they all said no. So he walked away and didn't give us any land. And it's just been, it's just been a, a, a big hot mess ever since. That said, a few of my great, great relatives, you know, great uncle and great auntie and great grandfather, they applied for public domain land and they got it. And so as a result of that, a lot of them got on the very first California Indian role, official Indian role in 1928. Um, a few years after that, 
in the early 19 or the, the I say the 1930s, right before America the war. Mm. They circled back and said, well, I guess there are some Indians there. We better go do something with them and settle them some land. Well, World War II hit and everything went to heck. What land that we had in public domain land was seized. Um, Colonel Hurst lost some of his land to the army. And the war created, they forgot. Ms. Crow, I'm sorry, your, your connection's breaking up again. Crap. I'll let what we hear. Is it better? It's, um, I can make out just barely what you're saying, but it, it's still pretty iffy. <sighs> oh, okay. I think you're okay now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, in the early 1960s, when PG&E put in the, the big generating plant at Morro Bay, they said, oh, there's no Indians around. They scooped a whole burial up and threw them into, um, you know, the, those big those big trash cans. And my great uncle, Johnny Blue Jay Garcia, went to court and, and got PG&E to return those and with a little bit of settlement so that we could have taken, took them and reburied them in the proper place. And this is very ironic because if that had happened today, we would have no rights to those to those burials because we're yeah. not on the BIA's list. And and the really weird thing is you try to explain this to a native journalist from a treaty tribe and mm -hmm. their eyes glaze over and they kind of mutter off going, huh? You know, and, and, and they at first at glass are going to say, oh, well, not Nagpur wasn't in place. No wonder you couldn't. I said, no. I said, when Nagpur wasn't in place, it was easier for us to go and reclaim these things. Of course, Berkeley, you know, as we all know, has has continued to to have the big, the big, you know, the big moat up around its archives. And it's now yeah. it's relying on Nagpur to keep to keep artifacts out of indigenous people's hands. So thank mm -hmm. you for saying that. Um, so in all of this, there was a couple of books published. And it says at the end, Selena and Indians are extinct. Oh, isn't it too bad? And I wrote to both of them and I said, we're still around. <laughs> and this one guy who was an archaeologist says, oh, no, you're trying, you're, you know, you're culturally extinct. And I wrote him back and they said, no, we're not. I said, we still live the same way we used to live, but you don't know it because we don't tell anybody. <laughs> and um, it's only been about the last 10 years that, that our tribal leadership has put its toe in the publicity water where they've issued some press releases. There's a website. Mm. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of what got me going is like, I can't get another native journalist to believe that I'm alive. I can't get the non-native journalist to believe I'm alive. I can't get the anthropologists and archaeologists to believe that we're still a functional community. Well, somebody has to tell them it might as well be me. Mm -hmm. And um, but ironically, I did not go to school for journalism. My first degree was in electronics. Mm. And yes, I worked in Silicon Valley for a while. <laughs> I hated it. But my aunties and my uncles and my grandparents said, no, you need to get a stable job. You, you can write your little stories on the side, Deb, um, because I grew up with my grandparents and I knew they told me everything. I am one of the, the carriers of, of culture now. If, you know, I, I'm a vector. I'm a cultural vector. That, that's a good phrase. I, because I'm a writer, so I come up with this stuff. Um, so they said, oh, you can, you, can, you can write on the side. You need to have a, a stable job. By this time, I'd been married and divorced and had a, had a child. And I hated it. I absolutely hated it. But somehow or another, um, Hubby and I had gone to Arizona. Mm -hmm. And Hubby left, and I stayed there where, where I'm here now. I met the husband, man I'm married to now. And I went back to school. Only I didn't go back to school to be a journalist because I've always been interested in science and technology. Mm -hmm. And Arizona State University was recruiting Native Americans to become science writers for the express purpose of, of serving as a bridge between traditional ecological knowledge that we all know is tech 
and Western science, which if okay. you really study the two closely, you know, have are just simply parallel ways to get to the same the same conclusion science wise and environmental wise and every other wise. Um, so I went to school for that and, mm -hmm. you know, life interfered again and I, I worked at several they've always been media related jobs but I always freelanced on the side always writing about native issues and writing about my people whenever i could um about 2017 i finally cut the cord went freelance full-time and i i was i was on my way i was freelancing for whoever would pay me i was having a great time mm -hmm. um getting reporting grants um and then in September 2019, I got a phone call. Oh, no, I should say it was in August from Arizona Republic. They said, oh, we heard about you. We've been kind of watching you. And we have this one-year one year fellowship, you know. I know you're freelancing, but, you know, a, a steady paycheck for a year. You, you wouldn't mind that, would you? And I said, no, my husband was very happy. He likes it when I have a steady paycheck. Um, so I took the one year reporting gig. It was a Polium Environmental Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And that was September, 2019. In March, 2020, the pandemic hit. I was still, I was still a fellow then. Um, I was literally the last reporter out, out of the newsroom in March, 2020. Oh. Because I had come back, they, they told everybody that, that day, take your stuff and go. And I said, well, I need to come back in the morning because because I needed to be there at six o'clock. There was some, and I just I just needed to come in the newsroom to do it because as you can tell, sometimes my Wi-Fi isn't all that. So I, I did the I, you know I did the online thing and I filed the story and and we got the photos from from USAT and USA Today, and I'm waiting on 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 edits. And the director comes over and says, get your laptop, get whatever you need, you're out of here. He says, I'll send you your edits at home. So I did that and didn't come back for like 18 months. But mm -hmm. in the meantime, they had secured a grant from the Katina Foundation to bring me on full time as an indigenous affairs reporter. So since, so April of 2021, I quit the fellowship and went to work for the Republic full time. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm telling you guys all this because you literally never know where something's going to take you. A lot of these, I'm going to give you all this advice right now. If you get an opportunity to do a one-year fellowship or in a six-year fellowship, A, make sure it's paid, of course, and B, those, those types of positions will frequently lead to full-time employment, especially if it's with a, an outlet you really like. Because mm -hmm. most of the Pulliam Fellows have stayed on, at least at the Republic. I can't speak for Pulliam Fellows anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So it's just been a blast. <laughs> That's great to hear. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and we appreciate the advice. Um, so I want to ask you, since your education background was involved in, well, environmentalism, you are an environment reporter, I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on the evolution of how our press, how the press covers climate, particularly with the continual escalation of climate change. And very notably, there's an article you wrote where the United Nations entity, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a report that uh, very notably looked at the contributions and issues that indigenous peoples face in regards to climate. So um, if you could touch on that, like sort of like overall, what's how's the evolution changing, not just in our press, but how we analyze climate and how indigenous people are impacted and involved? I still see way too much coverage where it says climate change, climate change, climate change, and it doesn't, I, it, there is a growing bit, you know, there is a growing number of reporters who've, who've become experts in climate enough to not just automatically assume something's caused by climate change. Mm -hmm. um, I still see too much where it says caused by climate change. And right now here in the Southwest, we are experiencing what we call a mega drought. Worst drought in 1200 years. 
And I can't tell you how many times I've, I've seen, well, the drought's caused by climate change. The mm -hmm. drought is not caused by climate change. And this is why you need to learn in, in you know, climate as a whole. Um, my elders say that there's been three of these droughts in the last 5,000 years. Mm. So we're right now we're in the fourth of a series of hundred and some year long droughts. What's changed, <clears throat> and this is where climate change comes in, is that something that naturally occurs is made worse. That's why hurricanes are worse. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me, droughts are worse. Right. Flooding events are worse. Rainfall is worse. Snowpack, you know, where places where it snows, it either snows. <clears throat> Uh, apocalyptic snow snow events or no snow <clears throat> there's either no hurricanes or a whole string of deadly hurricanes in california there's either the el ninos are are flooding out the state or la ninas are dry as a bone mm -hmm. um underlying all that of course is the continuing load of carbon in the atmosphere and the continuing warming of, of the ocean, which has been trying to absorb all that extra carbon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ocean's been trying to absorb all that extra carbon. The, the ocean is just about done now. And every half a degree, the ocean, the ocean, the, the water temperature rises. Is that many more species imperiled? You know, surf fish, coral, uh, kelp, abalone. All of those, all of those, those coastal area uh, plants and animals and fish that depend on a cool, cool ocean are in peril. Um, wildfires, they are, they are the proximate cause of, of the wildfires in the West is not climate change. The mm -hmm. proximate chart, <clears throat> proximate cause is 160 years of federal mismanagement that they want fire suppression, they, they prioritize logging and, and cattle over, over land and water stewardship. And the beginning of US statehood, Indians were shot dead for engaging in traditional cultural burning. Later on, they relented and they just arrested them and put them in jail. Um, <clears throat> and it's extremely difficult and it's extremely frustrating for us who know, whose elders have taught us the right way to to steward these lands and waters, to, to watch it all, all get mucked up in the matter of a few decades. Mm -hmm. um, but yet I have to divorce myself from that and still approach it, approach it um, objectively as a journalist. But I can also approach it objectively with this information. My, my, my journalism is informed by my cultural knowledge and what my mm -hmm. elders have passed on to me. It's also informed by what I've learned in, in the science writing program. You know, it's also been informed by doing fellowships like at Metcalf, where they went one whole week and explained about climate change. It's also informed by the fact my, my first, first bachelor's degree is in electronics. And I know something called the positive feedback loop. For those of you who, don't, who aren't into electronics, a positive feedback loop is bad. Because what happens is, is that those little amplifiers in your in your headphones or in your your home theater, they are rained back by what they call a negative feedback loop. So in other words, there's some little pieces in there, and and it's all been engineered to keep that that voltage current flowing at a certain predetermined level. Because too much, uh, you'll start getting feedback. You'll start getting um, you know your your sound will degrade and too much current building upon itself and building upon itself is just like a hurricane building upon itself. And finally you have an EF5 and you have burnt circuits and your, your speakers are trash and your entire home theater uh, smells like a, like, a, like a cigarette ashtray. So positive feedback loops are not just in electronics, they're also in nature. And that's what's happening with climate change. And I'm explaining this mm -hmm. to you guys because if you want to go into climate journalism, you also need to know basic ecological processes. It's not that hard. You can take a couple of classes in environmental journalism and, and you'll learn a lot.
Um, so what else do you want to know about around that? That's, but that said, there are some excellent environmental journalists out there who did take the time to learn and, and they are making that, that case between um, climate change, making a bad situation worse. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, uh, thank you for uh, bringing out that nuance. I've had heard that before, that climate change is not necessarily the only factor in all these environmental uh, hardships and disasters we're witnessing. Um, you did touch on something that I actually was going to ask about. I'm glad you said it, um, because you said that your your knowledge of what your um, your ancestors have done in forest management, that informs your reporting. So mm -hmm. I was going to ask, broad, that, that was one great example, but I wanted to ask also broadly, like, how does your um, your heritage, your culture, um, how, how does all that uh, help inform your reporting? What, what How does that knowledge affect how you approach things? Um, you know, a lot of it has to do, again, with, with oral histories, with, with knowing how the, the process is run on time. And there's also the, the cultural protocols. A lot of journalists trying to work in Indian country don't understand the protocols. They don't understand that you can't just pop into a, a tribal community and stick a, stick a microphone in somebody's face <laughs> and say, how do you feel? Um, if any time in journalism that, that the term um, building your beat applies, it's in Indian country journalism. You, you must, 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 if you're going to work in, in a native community, you need to learn, and not just general Indian stuff, because uh, in California, we never did powwow. We never had fry bread. We never had turquoise. We never had silver. So when you see somebody running around in pow powwow regalia and silver and turquoise, um, powwow is from the plains. Silver and turquoise is from the Southwest. Fry bread is a survival food. and and the culture and history of, of each tribal community you visit is going to differ and sometimes differ greatly from what the, the norm, what people normally associate with Native American culture. Uh, basically, there is no Native American culture other than what we call Native American popular culture. That mm. is the pan-Indianism. You know, powwows are everywhere now. Even some California Indians have gotten involved in powwow. Um, uh, fry breads become a thing, silver and turquoise jewelries become a thing, um, European glass beadwork has become a thing, Al although a lot of tribes did have uh, trade beads in, in different parts of the country than the plains. Um, here's a story that will really illustrate why it's important to learn the history and culture of the community you're in. I, I have some really good friends of the Wabanaki. Those are the four tribes of Maine, the people of the Don, the Passamaquoddies, the Penobscots, the Mi'kmaqs, and the Maliseets. And I like to go to the Maine Indian basket makers gathering in Bar Harbor. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy it. I enjoy meeting up with, with uh, even though I, can't, I can barely weave a basket to save my life, they are like master basket makers. It's really cool. We've become really good friends. And they're also first contact tribes. There are tribes, we all call ourselves first contact tribes. The, the first contacted on, on the East Coast, the first contacted here on the West Coast. Um, <clears throat> we're talking United States right now. We know that the Mesoamericans have been contacted way back. Um, about the only tribes that came out on top were the Pueblos. And that's only because they are common culture and their languages are related and they were able to, and, and their, their communities were all compact enough where they were able to mount a, an organized resistance and throw the Spaniards out for 12 years anyways. So mm. I go to Maine and I'm, I'm hanging there with my friends and we're having a great time and the Wabanaki bring out their drum. Now, they, they do have a big drum, like a powwow drum, and they have a, a drum group, and they were out there um, playing Wabanaki drum songs, and we, we were doing round dance, and then some other 
uh, some other dances that are unique to to the tribes in Maine. Mm -hmm. And there's a university nearby, and there was this very nice young man from I don't know what it had one of the Northern Plains tribes because he was wearing what we call Northern Straight Man's powwow regalia. You know, there's different regalia for different powwow uh, variations. He was wearing Northern Straight, so he comes out. And he's trying to dance to the to this Wabanaki drum song. And he couldn't quite get the beat right. And then in between, he walked over and he says, um, what are you guys doing? And I said, well, we're, we're doing our songs. And he says, but, but, but and they looked at him and they go, our, our, our songs are different than your guys' songs. So this is why if you go to Maine, you know, get a book and read about the four tribes of Maine. Um, start to get to know people. Artists are always a good, good way to start because they are used to dealing with media. They're used to dealing with people in general because they have to be out there to sell their stuff. And you can kind of start making your way in. And building trust is very, very important. You can take years building trust with with the tribal community, and it only takes once to mess it up. And that's because of all of the misreporting and errors and, and they, they rely way too much on reporting tropes and stereotypes and assuming that we're all alike and we're not. Um, so you just have to be really careful. And when, once, you, once you start learning about that community and get a couple of people who, who will talk to you, ask them, what is your protocol to meet an elder? What is the protocol I need to follow to talk to a tribal leader? What is, what is the protocol I need to engage with these people? Um, and I know everybody says, you know, don't accept anything, don't give anything, don't pay your sources. Um, there's a really easy way to get around that. Uh, I can get away with it because I'm indigenous myself and I usually give them a little token. Um, they're giving of your time, and the least you can do is I. California white sage is part of culture, and I usually have like a little sprig of white sage and a little mini abalone shell. It represents where I'm from. It represents my culture, and it's just a nice little cultural gift. Um, and it's not really like you're paying them. Um, you know, it's just it's just a, a nice little token, right? And if you're not, you know, if you're not native yourself, are you Irish? Are you British? Are you Welsh? Is there something that you can think of that reflects your culture? This is a gift from my culture to your culture as a token of, and it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be expensive. In fact, if, if, it's, if it's expensive, then you're probably violating your, your outlets journalism ethics. Um, so something that that's just of yourself, you know, uh, um, a maple leaf if you're from wherever, um, mm -hmm. a little four leaf clover, you know, something like that. Um, but because I make my own jewelry and I make my own stuff, I generally have stuff around that I can just make up a gift bag. But I mean, these are just little things. Mm -hmm. and, and tribal leaders are generally, you know, really, really busy. And you can get you can get by with a 15 or 20 minute interview because they know how to talk. You know, they, they know that they've got this much time to get their point across. They know, you know, they pretty much know what you're going to ask when you're talking to an elder, when you're talking to a cultural practitioner, when you're talking to an artist, you definitely can't be in a hurry. Just let let it go how it's going to go. Um, um, you know, be prepared for them to think about what they're going to, to say to you and make sure that, that, and make sure you have a way that you can go back and fact check. They love it when you come back and fact check. <laughs> no, nobody will ever get on your case in Indian country. They will appreciate the opportunity if you've misspelled something or if there's a, a, um, a particular nuance of that culture that you that you need to get correct it's like oh or, or did you is this where you know in, in all the usual stuff read reason back to the quote is this really you know what i heard you saying was yada 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 
And to me, that's a way to fact check on the spot. Because when, when you repeat back what they've just said, it's like, um, you know, the, the, moon, the moon in October means it's, it's time to start harvesting um, maple. It's like, oh, okay, so what, do you have a particular name for that moon? Because a lot of them are in their language. What is it in your language? Can you spell it for me? I'm always running spellings back. Oh my God. Um, right. that's, yeah. that's really great sound advice. And you mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm gonna get to uh, sacred spaces in a bit, but briefly, okay. you, you briefly, you mentioned uh, tropes and negative stereotypes that are common in the press. Like just, just uh, real quick, could you tell us what, what are they and how we can avoid them? Um, Native American Journalist Association has some really good reporting guides. Um, especially when it comes to finding an expert, it, it, it's, it's snarky and it's fun, but it works. But one rule of thumb that you can always keep in your head is journalism professor Duncan McHugh, who's, who's a member of one of the First Nations in Canada, and I'm sorry, I don't remember which one. Um, he's come up with, with this very simple uh, mnemonic called, uh, you know, avoid the dreaded WD4. And the four Ds, if, if you see your story have, has too much of these, dead Indians, drunk Indians, drums, and dancing, you may have a problem. Now, unless, of course, mm -hmm. you're covering the world championship hoop dance, in which case you're going to have lots of dancing and drums. That, that's great. Um, but if you start falling into poverty porn and, oh, these poor Indians, and it's perfectly mm -hmm. okay to say, um, you know, they're trying to overcome their 50% unemployment rate by doing X, Y, and Z, but don't dwell on the 50% unemployment over and over and over again. Okay. Um, some people have problems with substance abuse. Don't dwell on it over and over again. You know, it is what it is. And the W stands for warrior. You see my little thing here. Um, a lot of people fall into this thing, you know, Native Americans are all you know, great warriors and, you know, we, and it is true, we do serve at higher rates. And some of that is because of patriotism, some of that's a desire to help the homeland, and some of it is because it's the only job they can get. So it's good to talk about veterans, but mm -hmm. don't make, don't make, don't rely on that as, and, and don't make that a trope. Um, okay. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Well, um, I wanted to show our audience uh, some of your really impressive work. This was a, uh, I'll go over to the website. Uh, this was a multimedia project series of articles. I strongly encourage you all to check it out for yourselves because it's it's a really fine piece of work. And in this uh, uh, series titled Sacred Spaces, you explore in depth why the sort of uh, cultural and legal barriers indigenous people face in protecting sacred or culturally significant sites that are off tribal lands. And I'll play just a short video um, from the series that your colleague produced to supplement your reporting so uh, our audience here can get a, a better idea and look on, on what it was, uh, what the reporting entails. Looking at the history of mining, what has it actually done? Yes, they talk about jobs and money, but if you look at the aftermath, so much devastation and so much illness. I sit here today defending this land. All these years, you know, of, of us playing by the rules, legally, politically, depending on them doing the right thing, never transpired. We were told that this place here would forever be protected. You get a foreign mining company, foreign stockholders, they really control this place of America. This place is full of historical um, belongings to all of us. When it comes to indigenous people, you can't separate the religion from the environment because this is our tools. This is where we um, get all our resources to conduct our ceremonies. So you can't separate it. So to have the sweat on the holy land where the angels are at is awesome because it, it, the intensity is different. Every man that has sweat here, they're rooted right here. 
we tell them that in a difficult time that you're in, and you want to pray, you can close your eyes and you hear the drums, the singing, your spirit is in here and it goes back to where you're at. Everything that we do here is about Mother Earth. With the Oak Flat movement and the, being it religious, it's brought out the ugliness of what's happened to our people and how the deceit of how America was founded, a genocide on our religion and our identity. And like I said, that coincides with the environment because you can't separate the two. They want to erase that we've even existed here for corporate greed. If they continue to rape Mother Earth, we're left with nothing. And we all know by now is that as older we get, the precious thing in life is just to be happy and enjoy. It's not the money you make. You're killing everything that makes you live. And all we're trying to do is teach other people. That's all we're doing. And we're hated for it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really incredible work. Uh, and just briefly before we get into our Q&A, can you tell us what, what was your inspiration for that uh, story, how the reporting went? And I understand the Biden administration apparently responded to that. So could you tell us mm -hmm. about that? Um, the inspiration. Down, down at Morro Bay, there's Lasamo, Morro Rock. In case any of you guys have ever been down to Morro Bay, that big, giant, humongous rock dome. That's a place of sacredness and power to not only my people, but the Chumash, the Yokuts. A lot of Indian people used to come and pray there. And that's also where they, they dug up the burial when they were building the PG&E plant. But um, it's a state park. And we have to get a permit to go pray there. We, we can't. Wow. Yeah, if you're gonna do a, a ceremony and you don't want the the general public interfering, you have to get a permit. And that that's like getting a permit to go use the Catholic church that you worship at every week. Right. You know, it's and I know there's so many places like that. Most of most of the cultural and sacred sites that are important to Native people are not on the reservations, they're not on the trust lands. They're and they're most of them are in public lands. And um, I've been the lead Oak Flat reporter for seven years now, you know, and I've seen everything, uh, all the little skullduggery it took to get that, that bill passed and to, to make the land swap possible, which is still kind of in limbo, by the way. And so it just kind of said, you know, we need to do something about that. There are other places in Arizona, because it is the Arizona Republic, that we wanted to show um, how Native peoples have been stymied in being able to worship or preserve these places without, without exploitation, without being destroyed or severely um, developed or damaged or impacted. So we just made up a list and started talking to people. And we did this during the pandemic, which is why there's only three videos, but it is what it is. Um, and so the series came out in August. In November, the Biden administration decided it was time to announce extra protection for these sites. And then there, later, and then there's an MOU out there now. And then there's some other things going on. Um, so somebody in Washington must have read it, is all I can say. <laughs> which is pretty cool yeah yeah it <laughs> is pretty incredible. work has results <laughs> yes absolutely it's very inspiring for all of us here um well uh we've reached the portion where we can have an audience q a if any members either here in person or virtually have a question uh there is a mic in the back so that miss crow can uh, be able to hear your question so simply uh we can start with in person uh, i see that cesar is approaching the mic Mrs. Deborah, thank you so much. My name is Cesar Rojas. Um, I'm from Bogota, Colombia. I've covered the indigenous issues in the past. I always try to keep learning about this because, of course, I'm 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 not a Native American. I'm not in any part of any indigenous community back in my country. But I always respected, and I'm trying to keep learning about like uh, all the 
indigenous struggles down there specifically with issues like pretty similar to what you reported. Um, there's a lot of uh, struggles and tensions between uh, oil companies and indigenous communities in the Amazon rainforest in southern Colombia. And right now I'm starting a new, a new process. I'm here in the documentary track, so I'm working on video. And, and you already mentioned like some of the issues, uh, like some of the tropes that we should avoid uh, while covering uh, indigenous communities or, or Native American communities. And I wonder if I imagine that the same uh, mistakes uh, happen when we are working on video. And, and, and I wonder if you could like give us some kind of recommendations like for avoid those kinds of tropes while showing video and portraying uh, Native American communities in documentary. And I would, I, I would highly appreciate if you could like give us some recommendation of some re documentaries that, you, that you've admired in the past. Thank you. Um... We've been doing a pretty good job of, of incorporating, um, you know, or avoiding tropes. One, one thing I always, that, that just really frosts my cookies is, is using music and drumming um, just because, oh, well, this is a native piece, so we must use flute music. And you notice that there was some singing during the, the Oak Flat video, but that's part of the story because, because they were, they were um, doing the protest march, they were singing as they were marching, it was an integral part of the, the, the video. Uh, we did another one where we went to Imperial County and they were doing bird songs. Bird singing is something that's peculiar to Baja and to Southern California. It's done with gourds and these songs, the cycles, it's entire cycles of history. It's history and prayers and particular cycle that was in that video was telling the story of Indian past and Karuk uh, or, or Carrick. Sorry, I got, I get that one confused with Karuk tribe. Carrick, which is that a very, very sacred area to the Quetzal people. But that's integral to the story. Then you see these NBC, you know, the, I'm sorry, NBC, I hate to, you know, point you out, but you're the, you're the one I think of the most here lately is that they had done a, a video piece on the impact of COVID-19 in Navajo Nation. And so they open it up with, with a hand drum song and there's no reason for it. They're just doing it because, well, it's a na native community it must be, you know, out there in the middle of the res doing their hand drum and singing. Uh, that is definitely a trope. Um, if that, if the native, if the indigenous community that, that you want to film, um, if there are any particular songs or song cycles that, that you think could be an integral part of your documentary, by all means, ask them. In fact, that's a really good rule of thumb, ask. You know, they'll tell you if it's something they don't want filmed. They'll tell you if it's something they don't want photographed. They'll tell you. They have no, no um, compunctions about telling you. But you won't know unless you ask. Um, I don't know. You know, I I can tell you tell you, I can tell you cringeworthy stuff documentaries more than I can things I really like, but. My, my good friend, the late Myron Dewey, did some really good work at Standing Rock. Um, so if you can find anything by Myron Dewey on, on YouTube, he did really, really good work. And he's, he was from, um, um, North, he was Northern Paiute. He got killed in a car wreck here about a year ago and they still haven't brought the guy out. Is in process along. Um, the process it was Ms. Here. Crow, I'm sorry, your your connection's breaking out again. Uh, I see that it says unstable. Is it back? It's it's a little more you're frozen, but we can hear you now more clearly. Okay. Oh, okay, I yeah, think so, okay. 
So yeah, Myron Dewey did some really, really good work. So he's he's a his work's available on, on YouTube. Um I that's about all I can think of for on the good side at the moment. I it's hard for me sometimes to watch these documentaries because I'm always trying to I, I always see stuff in there and they drive me nuts. So um and watch some of the stuff we've done in the Republic. Some of them are like 15, 20 minutes long and, and it's good stuff. Watch Myron's stuff. Um, Dennis Obama, uh, I'm sure I'm mangling her name. She's a Canadian First Nations documentarian. Her stuff is really good. Um, what was her name again? Sorry. Alanis O-B-O, let's see here. Uh, o B O O T A L A A. Nation film. Okay, Alanis and her her. Last name is spelled O B O M S A W I N. She she is an excellent filmmaker. She's Abenaki. She's you know a Canadian First Nation member. Hers hers I can watch without cringing because really good work. So thank you thank you for those recommendations and and, and advice. Uh, do we have another question from the audience? No. Oh, I see Andrew is approaching the mic. Um, and after him, Rick, if uh, you could see if there's any questions from the online stream. Oh, there isn't any right now. Okay, go ahead, Andrew. Hi, Ms. Kroll. My name is Andrew Lopez. I'm a second year audio uh, journalist here at the J School. Um, you mentioned that you were freelancing in, in the past earlier in your career. What are some um, things that you would maybe do differently looking back on your freelancing career? Um, speaking as someone who wants to freelance as soon as I graduate. Thanks. I wish you luck. There's so many people trying to freelance right now. Um, I think one thing is that I probably should have gone full time sooner because I I think I I must have I I know I lost out on some really great fellowship opportunities because I was you know working day jobs and then freelancing on the side. Um, but I have been freelancing off, you know, either part-time or full-time for almost 20 years before I finally got a full-time journalism job. And even one time I was running a tribal newspaper and still freelancing on the side. And it takes a while. It, if you're going to freelance these days, um, I would say get a day job first because it's really rough out there with a lot of the, the layoffs. You know, Gannett laid a bunch of people off. Uh, Gimlet laid a bunch of people off, podcasters. Get a regular job, freelance on the side, build those connections. What, what I, I don't, I'm assuming this, this works for audio the same as for, for um, the written word. Editors want, um, low drama, they want clean copy turned in on time that they don't have to mess around with too much. Um, and they want to know, they want people that they can rely on. So in my in, you know, nearly 20 years, I had a nice little, little stable of clients built up that they knew if they gave me an assignment, it would get done, it would get done right, it would get done well, maybe a day or two late, but I mean, it would get done pretty much on time. So um, I, I wish you luck, but really and truly get a day job right now, um, get some experience, you know, start building up those those freelance connections. So there's a, 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 he's now a documentary filmmaker by the name of David Wallace, who worked at the Arizona Republic. Miss Crow, sorry, you, you're frozen. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you now. So they've all been working for a while, like in years, and people started out do stuff for him. Um, and then he finally was formed in Ms. Crow, sorry, it, it started breaking up again. Okay, um, you're no longer frozen. I oh. I think we're getting back. Okay, so and build up those sources, build build up a, a body of work, and if your if your outlet allows it, because Gannett doesn't, um, start start freelancing on the side, saying I have you know these clips. And this is my proposal. Um, oh, and the other advice I give any freelancer, prospective or working, um, put a business plan together. Do not just assume it's all about the art. It, you have to approach it as a business. I've had my own little writing, little micro business for 20 years. I, I pay my taxes, I pay my business taxes, I do my write-offs. I got audited one year, and because I'm OG and I use just a plain old recording of reporters, I mean, a, a, an accounting book, and I either have a paper, a piece of paper, or I have electronic something, PDFs on a CD, and all I did was hand it into them, I saved myself a thousand bucks. So if, if, you, if you do go, do that, keep your receipts, um, run it like a business. Um, you will definitely do a lot better, and you won't be you won't be getting in trouble with Uncle Sam. <laughs> well, Miss Crow, thank you so much for that advice. Uh, it looks like we have time for just one last question. If anyone has one from either our audience uh, in person here or virtually. Um, okay, Rick shaking his head. Okay, well, then I'll ask the last one. So I'm looking at our audience in person here, Ms. Crow, and I see that it's entirely young journalists of color. What advice do you have for us uh, to navigate this predominantly white industry? Um, do excellent work. Keep doing excellent work. Grow a thick skin. Don't let the, don't let the bastards get you down. You know, I've heard it all. You don't look like an Indian or how come you're only doing Indian stuff or or your stuff is slanted towards Native people, none of which are true. Of course, you know, I'm a California Indian, so we're all mixed. You know, I have, I have heard it all. Um, but the best thing is just do excellent work. You know, I did. It took me took me 17 years to get on with a big giant major daily. Of course, I hadn't really pursued getting on with a big major daily. I figured I was just going to be freelancing forever. Um, don't be afraid to advocate for cultural appropriateness. Always put journalism ethics first. Um, make sure that your editors know that that your journalism it can is informed. By, by your background, but your background is not dominating your journalism. So I'm an indigenous journalist. I, I follow, you know, you know um, basic journalistic principles, but because I have, I have all this knowledge that my elders gave me, that their elders gave them, and because I've engaged in Indian country, you know, basically all my life, and professionally for more than 25 years, I have an edge on everybody else. And that's that can be your experience too. Uh, but yeah, don't don't get it, you know, get a thick skin, don't take everything personal. Um, and and the work will come. But just just keep on doing what you're doing. Understood. Well, Ms. Crow, uh, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to speak with us on a Friday afternoon. We, we greatly appreciate your time and your, and your really incredible advice. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks. And thanks for putting up with my cruddy Wi-Fi. Lots of call cocks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Ms. Crow. Uh, you have